Hi, everyone. This is America Adapts, the climate change podcast. Hey, Adapters. Welcome back to the podcast. Joining me in this episode is Sherry Goodman. Sherry is considered the godmother of climate change and national security and coined the term threat multiplier. She is a senior fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center and the senior strategist at the Center for Climate and Security. Sherry shares with us some of the early history of climate change in Congress and the executive branch. We learn about emerging threats and how climate change is a threat multiplier. We also dig into the perils of securitizing climate change. It's a lively conversation with one of the leaders in the field of national security and global warming. Okay, don't forget to subscribe to the America Daps newsletter. We highlight the latest episode and news and stories related to that episode's topic. We also highlight other climate pods and share a few other adaptation-related goodies. In the show notes, there is a link to subscribe. And here's a call to action. Encourage your friends and colleagues to subscribe. We're looking at other platforms to communicate with the public in addition to this podcast. Coming up on the next episode is Dr. Andrew Rumbach. Andrew is an associate professor of landscape architecture and urban planning at Texas A&M University and faculty fellow at the Hazard Reduction and Recovery Center. We're going to take a look at how hazard mitigation does and does not overlap with climate adaptation. Looking forward to that. Okay, adapters, let's join Sherry Goodman and discuss the perils of the securitization of climate change. Hey, Adapters. Today, I have a very exciting episode. I'm talking with Sherry Goodman. Sherry is considered the godmother of climate change and national security and coined the term threat multiplier. She is a senior fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center and the Center for Naval Analysis and the senior strategist at the Center for Climate and Security. Hi, Sherry. Welcome to the podcast. Hello, Doug. Pleasure to be here. We're going to talk national security and climate change, and it's an area that I want to get into more with the podcast, but maybe just some background first. You are at these think tanks. Could you just give a brief background? What is the Woodrow Wilson International Center and I guess the Center for Climate and Security? What do those two organizations do? Sure, Doug. Well, the Woodrow Wilson International Center is uh, the nation's number one regional think tank with centers covering, covering every region of the world, as well as environmental change and security. We also have a polar institute, often sometimes referred to as the polar or Arctic public square. We bring to people together, scholars, practitioners, media, students, academics, to address global challenges in every region of the world. At the Center for Climate and Security, we are laser focused on climate as a security consideration, which every day becomes ever more urgent. Okay, so you've been doing this area, and I want to talk about your history. I have a bunch of questions related to what's going on right now, but I think your, your personal history, professional history is very interesting. When I talk to people doing adaptation and someone's been doing it for 10 years or even 15 years, they've been doing it for a lifetime. You are going even much further back, and I, I would lo- like to really – could you describe that you're so impro- – you've been with Congress, you've been with the Department of Defense. Just give us some of your history there. Sure. Well, I started out as the first – female professional staff member on the Senate Armed Services Committee, working for Senator Sam Nunn, Democrat of Georgia, when he was chairman of the committee. And as the youngest staff member, I was assigned the portfolio to oversee the Department of Energy's nuclear weapons complex. And during that period of the 1980s, we were still producing fissile materials for nuclear weapons in reactors and processing plants. And during that time, they all shut down for environment safety and health failures. So I sometimes say my career went from weapons to waste. Hmm. And after overseeing the nuclear weapons complex, and I had previously written a book about nuclear weapons, I then went uh, when I joined the Department of Defense in the 1990s, I was overseeing the Department of Defense's major industrial activities, environment, safety, health, and energy programs. During that period, we uh, we were cleaning up military bases, ensuring we complied with air, water, and waste laws, protected endangered species, conserved natural resources, and also conducting many uh, military-to-military environmental engagements to help uh, share best practices on environmental protection and stewardship 
with militaries around the world, particularly in the early post-Cold War period, those long gone halcyon days where we were promoting democracy, trust and civilian control of the military. So that's where I started. Let's talk about how climate change. And I'm curious, do you even remember the things late 80s, even, you know, Senator Al Gore was talking about climate change. But then even into the 90s, we had the Kyoto Protocol. Did you see it becoming part of the national security conversation? When did you first see that happening? Well, in 1990, Senator Nunn and Senator Gore together created the Strategic Environmental Research and Development Program. Congress passed this law on the defense bill in 1990, and that created the first major environmental research and development program in the Department of Defense. The purpose at the time was to take the vast body of research and development done in the defense and intelligence communities during the Cold War and put it to use to address environmental challenges. A combination of increasing environmental awareness during the 1970s and 80s with the growing number of environmental laws and Americans being aware of, you know, from silent spring onward about how our activities were degrading the environment began to be recognized even among federal facilities like the Department of Defense and, and Department of Energy. And so that awareness was almost reached its peak when I joined the Department of Defense in 1993. There were about 100 military bases that were listed as having Superfund sites, the most toxic cleanup sites in the country. And some of the military departments had already been sued for failure to comply with Clean Water Act laws and other environmental laws. So it was almost a mini crisis at the time because one of those lawsuits actually stopped training at Fort Bragg when the Army had not complied with the Endangered Species Act requirement to protect the, the red cockaded woodpecker right, right. that lives in the longleaf pine found abundantly on Fort Bragg and other military bases in the southeast. In fact, the military, U.S. military, has the largest state of longleaf pine left in the United States. It's found on Eglin Air Force Base in Florida. And that's because the way we operate America's military bases, they are protected from most of the urban and other types of development. And they have large open spaces. So they've become islands of nature. So the military really learned how to take these challenges and create opportunities from. Them. So eventually, the military began to see the home for the red cockaded woodpecker, for example, the tree in which it lives, as a realistic training obstacle. And instead of having to, instead of cutting it down to provide more training area, it actually used it to enhance training. And so that's just one of the many examples in which environmental stewardship became over the last quarter century really embedded in military practices. I guess what I'm getting at, though, is just even the specific thinking of climate change. In Kyoto, if I recall, it was 97 or 98 when it was rejected by the Senate. And here we have a potential international global treaty. And did the Department of Defense even take a, a – it's, it's a global treaty on global warming. Was there any chatter whatsoever saying, hey, we might have to contribute our perspective on what this treaty might mean? I mean, was there – the use of the word climate change going on then? Absolutely. So we were aware of it. You know, as you mentioned, uh, Al Gore and others had been testifying on this before Congress already starting in the 1980s. And in the lead up to the Kyoto Protocol negotiations in 1997, the U.S. Department of Defense, as part of the interagency process that the U.S. government undertakes to prepare for a major global treaty negotiation, we had begun to examine uh, the impact of reducing greenhouse gas emissions on military activities. And so that was really the first time, mid-1990s, that the Department of Defense looked at climate impacts on military activities. At that time, we looked at how to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from what are called non-tactical vehicles, like the many trucks and uh, fleets of vehicles that are on military bases, so how could you reduce emissions from those as well as on our peacetime installation and training activities? And so that was really the first encounter uh, that we had. And in fact, I sent two military officers on the U.S. delegation to the Kyoto negotiations. And 
one Navy captain and one Air Force colonel. And they were hugely valuable members of the delegation because they were willing to jump in and do anything from uh, helping negotiate specific provisions to bringing people coffee in the middle of the night. Because, you know, military are trained to be very can-do. Right. You know, chief cook and bottle washer, everything up and down the chain. And so that was hugely valuable. And I think the U.S. was among the only delegations at Kyoto uh, that had a uniform military members on it. Listen, this might be going deep, but did, when they came back, these two, did they have, OK, the, the national security implications of what these people are talking about are huge. Was there that kind of conversation happening or it just wasn't really, I guess, connecting the dots at that moment? Well, no, they well, they went back to their, you know, their other assignments right. when they returned. But they personally have stayed involved in climate security conversations and I find increasingly more military when they retire want to be involved in climate and energy security pursuits as their follow on mission. Uh, there must be a reason for that. But let, let's pivot a little bit here. And there, there's an expression. I don't know if you coined this, but I know you've written on this. And if you could explain to my listeners the climatization of security, what does that mean? It, may, it might seem obvious, but could you explain what that means? Okay. The climatization of security means including awareness of climate security risk throughout our national security planning, strategy, programs, and budgets. Because we now, we've known for the last 15 years now that climate change is a threat multiplier and that it aggravates our security risks around the world. So as we move into an era where climate change is shaping everything we do in every sector of society, we need also to think, to understand how climate change is affecting our security practices. This is a bit of a verbal jujitsu on a framing that has had some traction mostly in Europe in the last few years called the securitization of climate, mm. where there's been concern that climate change would be that the solutions to climate insecurities would be overly reliant on the military sector. And that, of course, is not the case. Most of the solutions and the to climate insecurities are really not military. The first order of business is really, you know, improved development, improved foreign policy, local uh, resilience building, community development, and military force is, of course, the last resort in any instance. On the other hand, you know, we do have military forces, of course, deployed around the world and increasingly deployed here at home in the United States to help our first responders respond to the nat increasing number of natural disasters we have that are climate aggravated from hurricanes to floods to wildfires. You've mentioned some of them, but I think this would be useful for my listeners, too, is just what are some more just the broader national security implications of climate changes? So if you think of sea level rise, you think of storms, but just some more of that context. Sure. I mean, what we call the climate threat multipliers or other people call climate perils. Heat, of course, you know, the planet is warming now at alarming rates, particularly in the polar regions. Sea level rise, you know, where I am on Cape Cod now. I recently learned that the beach is now has lost 700 feet, 700 wow. feet since 1968, which was probably the first year I came here as a child. And it used to be used to be losing two feet a year. And now, since 1995, it's losing 12 feet a year, 12 feet per year. And that's a combination of sea level rise and uh, coastal erosion. So I, I want to you know, be clear that there are some along the eastern seaboard. There's a level of erosion that is occurring. That's a, a phenomenon distinct from the climate impacts. But it. But it's some of it is aggravated by warming temperatures. Uh, we also have a vast seal and now shark population that we never had here before hmm. as a result of the warmer temperatures. OK, flooding. 
flooding is a risk not only in coastal regions, but in many inland areas as well, particularly in the Midwest now with the swollen uh, major rivers, Mississippi, Missouri, many others. You've got seasonal floods that have become devastating to to towns and communities. Uh, wildfires, you know, we see extended wildfires now uh, destroying much of the West, Alaska, parts of Australia. It's really almost a continent on fire. Hmm. Russia, disease, the rapid spread of uh, diseases, possibly even COVID, is aggravated by warming temperatures. One of the pieces I read, some of the background I read on you, I think, I'm not even quite sure, I, you were talking to Bangladeshi media, I think that's who it was, and the, the the issue of, I think it was sea level rise was the actual impact, but climate migration, and then the sort of national security implications of that, and so the conversation that you, I don't know if you recall that, but just it was, yeah, it seems like that's going to be one of the major drivers of disrupting, I guess, international relations. Absolutely. You know, we live in an era now of the greatest global migration since World War II. And that much of that is aggravated by the climate impacts, growing food and water insecurity across drought stricken northern Africa and the Middle East, sending people towards Europe, Central America and parts of South America. Also drought and storm stricken, the coffee crop crop in much of that region has been devastated and people can no longer pursue their traditional livelihoods, sending them fleeing at much personal peril northward into Mexico or into the United States. We can't forget small island nations, both in the Caribbean and particularly in the Pacific, whose very existence is threatened by climate-driven sea level rise and uh, loss of fresh water sources Uh, to the point that some countries, such as Kiribati, have already purchased land in other nations in Fiji in order to be able to have a place for their population to retreat. So you do a lot of writing now around these issues, and it's great material. And I want to take a quote from you. And the piece itself, I'm sure that the topic you'll you'll be able to identify, but let me just read it. I want to chat about this for a minute. First, the United States needs a new national narrative in which planetary health is a central element. Okay, so what were you trying to describe there? There, Doug, I was broadening our discussion beyond even climate change to include biodiversity and ocean health. Humans have so altered the planet over over centuries now, but but, uh, reaching crisis proportions now where they lack growing global biodiversity loss and species loss and harm to our oceans, which are so much a source of human health and sustainability, that we need to account for this in all of our planning particularly in in what I focus on in our national security planning. And so I've been working in the environmental movement. I've worked for conservation groups and such. And there's always this struggle, you know, especially domestically, to get, uh, I guess, a critical mass of people who care about these issues. Some people care about environmental issues very dearly. It's an intrinsic value. But if you think of planetary health, there's always the – a concern of what what are we really doing here? It's it's the the earth isn't a a, a person and I guess I'm I'm optimistic that now that national security is coming into play in the climate change realm a lot more, there's, uh, I guess, another, another narrative device to convince people that we need to do things as opposed to, OK, you know, you need to care for your planet. I don't, I don't know if it's a religious thing or paganism, but there's always that friction that goes on there. So do you think COVID, the, the COVID pandemic, actually helps with that narrative around planetary health? Do you think what we've gone through over the past year is actually the ad experience could, you know, be applied in making that narrative more likely? So the, you know, the COVID and climate or the COVID and health and and climate connections, our understanding of them are a bit like where we were about a decade ago, where we couldn't sufficiently attribute increased hurricane strength to climate change. But now, increasingly, we have the evidence and the data to show that the increased intensity uh, and frequency in these storms is partly driven by warmer waters and warmer air temperatures. So another quote related to some of these topics, you let me read this to you again. Putting natural security up front comes with one final benefit to the United States. It offers the opportunity to reject the premise that U.S. global leadership is in decline. Well, I consider that very optimistic. Could you elaborate on that? 
Right. Well, you know, as we as the Biden administration and others like to say, America is back. Right. OK. And we want to lead now and we lead with humility and respect for our allies and partners around the world. And that means reengaging in a whole variety of global undertakings from nuclear arms agreements to trade agreements to the Paris Climate Agreement. But then there are also a number of international conservation agreements and other forums that are very important for global biodiversity. Well, and you, you say specifically putting natural security up front. I think that's fantastic. And President Biden just famously got back into the Paris Climate Agreement just, the, I think, the first day or the day after he, he was inaugurated. I, I hope that's the case. I think, you know, we're I don't know if we're going to have these big swings back and forth with presidential leadership, but at least for four years, the U.S. uses – you know, itself using, I guess, climate change as an opportunity to, to reestablish some global leadership. I think that's a very optimistic view of things. You did a piece in Foreign Policy magazine in 2018 about China in the Arctic. And I want to talk about the Arctic a bit. But what's what's happening in the Arctic? Why is that such a hot spot when, when it comes to national security issues and climate change? Well, the Arctic polar regions are changing faster than anywhere else on the planet with temperatures rising at extreme rates of up to 100 degrees Fahrenheit in Siberia last summer and 70 degrees in parts of Alaska, both breaking records. Uh, permafrost is thawing and collapsing and sea ice is retreating. So that's opened a whole new ocean in our lifetimes and make the Arctic more available for both commerce and resource extraction. In the Arctic are thought to be some of the largest oil and gas and mineral deposits on the planet. So the, there are those who are extracting them. Uh, Russia has built up its energy infrastructure across its vast Arctic coastline. It's also trying to monetize the northern sea route as a toll road for transit from ports in Asia to ports in Europe and is also a remilitarizing uh, parts of the Arctic region. I guess I don't know enough about ocean law. And it, can you actually guess pass tolls for ships that are coming by within a certain range of your country? Is that even legally allowed, I guess, internationally? Well, Russia takes the view which which the U.S. disputes that the northern sea route along the Russian coastline is internal waters. Huh. It's a dispute, for example, that the U.S. also has with China in the South China Sea, where China has a view that parts of uh, the South China Sea are its internal waters, and the U.S. considers them to be international waters through which our warships can transit to preserve freedom of navigation. So that is uh, could similarly be the case along the Russian northern sea route. Speaking of China in the Arctic, and I, I think even just the last week, China is looking at a map. I don't they don't have because there's all these designations. You're actually in, like an Arctic country because you actually border it. But China doesn't border it. But they're actually trying to establish some sort of like formal diplomatic presence in the Arctic, something along those lines. Well, China seems to have uh, large Arctic ambitions and released its first Arctic policy in 2018, declaring itself a near Arctic stakeholder and envisioning a polar silk road. Uh, connecting its vast belt and road initiative to build maritime and land transportation bridges through across Asia into Europe, Middle East and uh, Africa, and envisioning also a polar route that would connect it to ports in Europe. So it is collaborating today with Russia, helping provide the foreign direct investment Russia needs to extract its energy resources and places like Yamal, and at the same time, gaining experience in Arctic operations and keeping an eye out for a future transpolar route that could open potentially in decades hence and enable China to be free of either Russian uh, control of the Northern Sea Route or U.S. preservation of freedom of navigation across Asia through the narrow Straits of Malacca and Hormuz. 
boy, I, I guess Russia is doing a dangerous dance there. On the one side, they want help, I guess, exploiting those natural resources and selling them. But at the same time, before they know it, China is going to have inroads in areas that they feel it's all theirs. That, that could be a, a troublesome area. And, you know, on that note. That's the frenemies, one right, might say. Right, right. It's you're making a deal with the devil there. I'm not calling either one the devil in this situation. But so when I read about China, and especially in the United States, when we talk about China, there's a lot of negative press. In this situation, beyond the natural resource exploitation, let's say it's oil, and that contributes more to global warming. That in itself is a negative. We don't want that. But why should we be concerned a country like China wants to have a much larger presence in the Arctic? Why is that a national security concern for us? There have been times uh, in the last five years when a snapshot of the waters off the coast of Alaska in the summertime showed more Chinese vessels than U.S. vessels. Wow. So more foreign vessels than U.S. vessels. So part of the American concern today is that we've allowed our capacity to operate in Arctic waters to atrophy. So we, we need to rebuild our icebreaker fleet. We need to uh, increase communications and navigation capability across the Arctic book to preserve American territory in the region. What keeps me up at night about the Arctic over the next several decades is the possibility of an accident as shipping increases across the region. Right. And Russia is, for example, we did a, a tabletop exercise a couple of years ago with the National Academy of Sciences where the scenario was a Russian nuclear icebreaker escorting a Chinese LNG energy tanker through the narrow Bering Strait, where the U.S. and Russia are only 30 miles apart at uh, their narrowest point, and the possibility of a collision or an incident between the Russian and Chinese vessels, which could lead to either an oil spill or uh, damage to the nuclear reactor, and the potential lack of transparency about what the conditions are, Mm potential loss of life. We know that Russia does not have a history of uh, sound nuclear safety practices. Think back to the Chernobyl incident or the sinking of the cursed nuclear submarine. Uh, And there have been many others where um, both Russians and those around the world did not know for some period of time what had occurred, what the risks were. So this is of, uh, you know, growing concerns such an oil spiller incident in the Bering Strait could make the Exxon Valdez oil spill, which was entirely within U.S. waters and wasn't even in the Arctic, look like something easy. Okay, so there's going to be a future of friction, I'm sure. But I wonder if there there are opportunities with China when you when you talk specifically about adaptation if you know we get more serious about what it means to adapt to climate change at a global level even in domestically do you think there are legitimate ways that we can collaborate with China on how we really are going to adapt to climate change is there any, any conversations along and those I mean I guess the goal here is just being that more diplomatic productive kind of interaction with China around climate change throughout the cold war you know we collaborated in certain spheres with our adversaries. And we're going to have to do that again now. We're going to be competing with China on many fronts. One of the constructive ways we can be competing with China is as we you know, ramp up our investment and capacity in green and clean energy in the United States to be selling that technology and innovation into that very large Chinese market because they need it to. They need to transition their economy. They need to reduce air and water pollution. Uh, and they're already a major manufacturer and purchaser of solar, wind, and other renewables. So we've got the innovation and technology. We need to be able to lead the field in that game. Also, there's also climate technologies. We better understand how to manage and predict uh, climate changes and and use that knowledge to uh, manage various economic sectors from agriculture to transportation. China needs that as well. There are areas where we would share. There are areas where we won't share technology and innovation. There are areas where we'll sell into that into that market. So I think those are some of the considerations we have to think about. I'm not a Chinese, China expert, but by any means, and it must be very vexing for people in the national security to think about China as an adversary, because you look back at Russia, 
we were barely doing any trade with Russia. And so we had this Cold War, longstanding, you know, you know, adversarial relationship with them. But China, like think of all the goods that we get from them. And then there's these other issues that we have national security concerns. It must make it very difficult to plan because we are so, inter, you know, connected with them in, in very profound ways. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. And, and although, you know, in the last few years, there were ways in which our the U.S. and Chinese economies became less connected, they're not going to be completely disconnected. And uh, particularly when it comes to reducing greenhouse gas emissions and managing climate risk, you know, China is the world's largest emitter. The U.S. is still a large emitter. India is right up there, too. So all the major emitters have to figure out how to transform their economies to be more climate resilient and reduce their emissions. And so there are going to be some common ways and there are going to be some competitive ways. Well, I think if we took a journey to Target together, I think if we took out every Chinese made thing, we'd probably have a quarter of the, the products in there. It's just, it's just, it is what it is. And that makes, I think, these kind of conversations tricky for just planning out there. But okay, I want to do a little bit of a pivot here again. And so the previous administration, it almost seems so long ago, right? It, it was in famously in deny about climate change, called it a hoax. This is from the very top. That's, it's not helpful. And I'm concerned, even though we've got four years of Biden, who knows after that, you never can predict that there's inevitably going to be these swings back and forth. What do you, I guess, what do you think? And are you in a, talking to people? Are you recommending, like, how can the Defense Department, how can the sort of the national security realm deal with these huge political swings back and forth? Like four years from now, could, would we potentially have the Department of Defense, you know, not acknowledging climate change at all? Well, I, I, I'm hopeful we, we won't go back to that. I mean, in, in many ways, even in the last administration, although they at the at the political level, they considered climate a four letter word is still the Department of Defense last year released a climate assessment tool. And that's an important tool that's going to be used now as we go forward to assess climate risk at military bases around the country. And so the work continued, even if it had, you know, even if they had to use other words, sometimes extreme weather substituting for climate change. But in many cases, they just kept focus on the reality of the threat. And, for example, the fact that the Department of Defense was able to develop and release a climate assessment tool for the whole department is a good thing. The fact that um, on the defense bills of the last several years signed by the you know, the last president, there was bipartisan support for a whole range of climate and energy security provisions directed at improving climate security across the Department of Defense and within the intelligence community. You had listened to my conversation with Commander Andrea Cameron at the U.S. Naval College, and I was surprised. I, I thought actually that we were doing more and she sort of, and maybe, you know, maybe you, you, you disagree with her, but she, I was surprised how little that was going on. And it, it was a, a bit shocking to me. I, I thought there were, would have been, like you just described, even a lot more going on behind the scenes. And it sounds like, you know, some of it might have been even just at a superficial level. So I'm hoping we're just going to see that ramp up big time now. Yeah. I mean, I think she's got, you know, Andrea has, a, a, you know, she's got a vantage point from the professional military education sphere where she teaches at the Naval War College. So she can look out and see that, uh, she is really leading at the Naval War College in this area now among the other professional military institutions. I think you'll see many of them begin to uh, raise their game and begin to offer, you know, provide that kind of leadership. And, you know, it, it's important to remember places like West Point, for example, the U.S. Uh, uh, military Academy, the Army Service Academy and also Naval Academy have been offering classes in this related to climate change for for some time in their engineering curriculum, I think the important thing now is that we're going to be able to lift it up into sort of the policy and, and, and leadership level. OK, so I've asked this question in my previous national security conversation, and I'm curious what you might say. And, and I guess I didn't give it this context when I asked originally, but is climate denialism in a policy sense, a national security threat, not just if in your own personal time, you don't think it's believable, but if it comes down to policy, it comes down to actual decisions being made. Is denial a, a, a true national security threat? Well, denial of any reality 
can become a national security threat, as we have seen with the disinformation campaigns of recent years, both domestic and foreign. They have posed threats to our democracy. The undermining of science in general is a a security threat. I mean, national security and intelligence leaders make decisions informed by science at their very foundation. I mean, think back if you think here's here's a good example. Military operational planning has forever been informed by understanding of meteorological and weather conditions. One very good example is the D-Day landings in Normandy in 1944. They were originally planned for June 4th, and the British and American meteorologists who were surveying uh, the weather conditions to give General Eisenhower the weather forecast came to the conclusion that the weather was not promising for a major landing that required visibility and calmer seas on June 4th. And it was their ability to 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 under, use evidence and for properly forecast that two days later on June 6th, would, there would be a small window opening. And, you know, the German meteorologists missed that. And that was partly the, the, the success of the D-Day landing was based on the weather. So forecasts, reliable forecasts, have long been a feature of military operational planning. In the climate era, that's more challenging because the weather is less predictable. I mean, it's always somewhat unpredictable, right? But now you can't rely on historical records necessarily to know the intensity of the storm. And I, and I want to keep following up on this because I have no doubt that the, the military, the rank and file, they're using science. They just need to. They need to make the decisions based on that. But as you well know, is the Department of Defense is populated with political appointees. And so let's a high level political appointee is getting confirmed in Congress and is asked point blank. Do you think climate change is a threat? Do you think it's for real? And they just come out and say, no, I think it's a hoax. If that person's going to the Department of Defense, they're influencing policy. They're influencing a lot of on-the-ground decisions. They're influencing readiness that if you don't allow the military to uh, start planning out some of these issues, then that has real-world consequences. And so I guess that's sort of the scenario where you could have another administration full of people that are just saying climate change isn't real. I, I suppose you could, although I'm, I'm hopeful we, will, we won't ever go back to that, to that era, but that we – would you know the real the real issues right now are kind of what's the solutions and and what's the pace of the energy transformation and that's where we should be debating and making decisions no i agree and i think we're going to get four good years and that's how I, my our foot of final pivot is you know wrapping up this conversation it's like i i have confidence i guess that's how much confidence i have in president biden that and the team that he's bringing in we're just going to see a lot of great action it's just i'm thinking the next president 20 you know 2024 let's say it flips back to the other side what does that mean do we start over and start from scratch and i just don't think if i would have asked you 10 years ago like do you think we would have had a president like president trump you just you probably said that's just not likely and we did and i we could easily have this situation again where climate change is just buried and how do we plan for that and so i i, I guess it's maybe premature but on on that note i do want to pivot it, it, to President Biden, and you know a lot of these people, you see what's happening. Could you give us an overview? What, how does it look for the, uh, the appointees and such? Is, is it looking good in regards to climate change and national security? Yeah, this is a very climate forward administration. As you know, John Kerry is the president's climate envoy. And the uh, NSC, the National Security Council, also has leaders who have a lot of deep experience in climate change. There's a domestic climate advisor in Gina McCarthy, former EPA administrator. And and all of the the senior leadership at the White House really understands and appreciates and is committed to working on these on these issues. Now, are the the engaging because I'm not quite sure with the Center for Climate and Security, even the Woodrow Wilson, some of these think tanks with people like you just, you know, there you are. You have this expertise. But, you know, depending on what the administration is, there's not as much interaction. And so I imagine that the dynamics with people in government and your think tanks is going to hopefully be a lot more information exchange. Are you seeing any kind of movement that way? Yes, absolutely. This is related to in regards to the people that he's bringing in. And I, I've had a brief conversation with someone who's in the space is that 
he has this all-star team. I, I totally agree, Jim McCarthy, John Kerry, but not necessarily the, the emphasis on adaptation. And I, I get that these people appreciate adaptation. They're not going to be hostile toward it or anything, but it's it's not being elevated per se, maybe at the uh, the level that you're seeing some of these other people where they're, they're known more on the mitigation side. Is that wrong, or do you, do you feel that, that they're bringing in people that really understand and are leaders in, in the adaptation side of climate change? I think they've already brought in some leaders who understand that, and I'm, I'm sure they're going to be more. So I, I think they're going to be able to focus on both the mitigation side, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, transforming our energy system, but also be able to focus on adaptation and resilience. I think that's that's equally important because so much temperature rise and greenhouse gas emissions consequences are already baked into the system mm -hmm. that we have to build a more resilient future. So you know, when you think about what Pete Buttigieg is going to do with transportation in, you know, transforming our, our roads and, and, and making them more electric vehicle friendly or at the agriculture department, all of that is in part about enabling adaptation and resilience. Okay, so you, we were just talking about um, Commander Andrea Cameron at the U.S. Naval War College, and you participated in Climate Change and National Security Conference she, she put together. What did you think of the event? Oh, I, th I thought it was great. I, I thought that she uh, upped the ambition of the professional military education community, which is an important part of climate proofing our national security community, because we have to teach and educate our next generation of military and national security professionals. So if you care about something, you teach on it. Think about cyber. You know, we've developed in the last decade whole curriculums and schools and new commands on cyber because it's a threat, you know, and a, and a concern that military throughout the system, whether, whether they're experts or not, need to understand and appreciate. And the same now is becoming true for climate. Okay, so I wrap up my episodes asking, and I've added a question here, but this I ask all my guests this, but can you recommend one Twitter account that people should follow? You're on Twitter, you tweet, so is there anyone that you'd recommend that mm -hmm. they'd follow? Well, I, I like the, the Twitter account for the Center for Climate and Security and the International Military Council on Climate and Security. So I, I would follow both of those, Center for Climate and Security and the International Military Council on Climate and Security. They're, they're related, but, but the International Military Council on Climate and Security includes uh, also a, sort of a global look and with military leaders around the world. And so I have show notes for each episode, and I'll include uh, the, the link to their Twitter accounts. And I actually do a newsletter, and just recently I highlighted the Center for Climate and Security. So I agree. It's a great um, site to follow. And last question, if you could recommend anyone to come on this podcast. Oh, also, can I, can oh, I, go add, on, one, go. Can I add one thing? I also want to add my other because I love all my children. Okay. Uh, I have three children. I have multiple think tanks. So I also have to recommend the new security beat at the Wilson Center. The new security beat at the Wilson Center and polar perspectives. Okay. Awesome. Perfect. Okay. I'll list all yeah. those. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Last question. And if you could recommend just one person to come on this podcast, who would it be? Well, I would. Can I recommend several people? <laughs> you know, I try to stick with one and everyone does several. And of course you can. So go ahead. Okay. Well, I, I would recommend John Conger who's the executive director of the Center for Climate Security and was my successor in the Department of Defense. I'd also recommend Sharon Burke, who was the assistant secretary for operational energy in the Department of Defense. And then I would recommend Rod Schoonover. Done a lot of work on ecological and natural security. And uh, we're releasing, he, he's leading a report that we're releasing soon on that. That would be a timely uh, interview for you to do with Rod when that report comes out. And it's always easier if I it, so if potentially make introductions, having sort of an end, if that's possible to do with you. Sure. Excellent. Happy to. Sherry, this has been a, a real pleasure and, and an honor to have you on. You are a, a legend in this space. And it's like I said, it's a conversation I want to keep having in the years ahead around national security and climate change. And I appreciate what you're doing. And thanks for coming on the podcast. Happy to do it. I like what you're doing with your America Adapts podcast. You're getting the word out to more Americans. And you're good at weaving an excellent story together. Well, thank you so much. Okay, Adapters, that is a wrap. Thanks to Sherry Goodman for coming on the podcast. There's so much ground to cover on climate change and national security. I really thought Sherry's point about the securitization of climate change was a really important one. 
On the one hand, if the national security establishment is elevating climate change as an issue, then that means a well-funded and highly influential partner has joined the fray. But there are also perils to that approach, and it might move in a direction that lacks transparency that we take for granted in other sectors. I got my start working on climate adaptation in the early aughts in the conservation sector. It was an exciting time, but also frustrating, because it's a sector that is poorly funded and not high on the list of priorities for your average American. Yes, I'm afraid that's true. We're certainly at a unique moment where a lot of different groups are coming together on this emerging issue of climate change. Hopefully, with the new administration, it can be done in a thoughtful, transparent way. We'll keep at it here on America Adapts, sharing these viewpoints. I want to thank Dr. Sweta Shakapardi for making introductions to Sherry in the first place. Thanks, Sweta. Okay, so if you're interested in highlighting your adaptation work in a podcast via America Adapts, think about using a podcast. Sponsoring a podcast allows you to focus on the work you're doing and sharing with climate professionals from around the world. I normally connect with folks at conferences and meetings, but that has been shut down for the past year. So definitely reach out to me directly if you have some ideas for this type of episode. That's how I keep the lights running. So maybe your organization wants to highlight the great work you're doing. Email me at americadaps at gmail.com. So most of you have heard me talk about the work I'm doing at Simpatico Studios. Folks, that's full steam ahead. I'm hosting live talk shows on the Climate Adaptation channel. I'm interviewing climate adaptation experts, clean energy entrepreneurs, and academics from around the world. It's a whole channel dedicated to climate change. And speaking of TV studios, consider using Simpatico for your own video production needs. Maybe you teach a course, you want some video production as part of that. Want to capture a panel, workshop, or even a conference, and you want something more professional than just a Zoom call, then consider using Simpatico. Go check it out to learn some more in my show notes. Okay, another reminder, we have the podcast in the Classroom Initiative. On the America Adapts website, you'll find a link to the page where we have discussion guides developed for over 20 of these episodes. It's a really cool resource. Consider using podcasts in your classroom, no matter what venue, high school, college, workplace training, use podcasts. Some final housekeeping. Don't forget to join the Facebook page and the Facebook community group. Sign in, join. I'll let you in right away. Some really cool conversations are on there. On that note, I love hearing from you. Take the time to email me just to say hi and who you are. And if you're in the field, let me know what you do. I love hearing from you guys. Tend to give shout outs when I can. It's very valuable to me to know who you guys are and what you're doing because it helps guide the content that I provide for you. So reach out at americadaps at gmail.com. Okay, check out the website at americadaps.org. Okay, adapters, keep up the great work. I'll see you next time.